Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm Alistair. You may remember me from my role on the Magnus Archives, where I played Peter Lucas, Tim's favourite kayaking instructor, and the oboe teacher that taught Martin that music really does live in his soul. Before we get started, uh, I need to walk you through just what Rusty Quill is for anyone who may be brand new. If you are brand new, hello! Uh, if you're not brand new, hello! Wide band enthusiasm, broad church, all that good stuff. Rusty Quill is an entertainment company and podcast network with a particular focus on audio drama. They have three weekly podcasts, The Magnus Archives, which is horror-focused and extraordinarily good, RQ Gaming, which is an actual play uh, RPG podcast with incredibly deep lore and vast interconnected characters that's really, really good fun, and Stella Firma, which may legitimately be one of my favourite ever pieces of science fiction. It's all fantastic stuff. This is a ludicrously talented group of people, and it's an incredible honour to not only stand with them, but also work with them, and every now and again be given this to play with. Now, you might be asking at this point how you can support these amazing folks, and the answer is both really simple and kind of predictable. The exact same way you can support every single other creative in the world right now who isn't attached to a studio or a movie production house or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. It's really easy. You can donate directly. You can subscribe on Twitch, where we are. Uh, you can donate through the Patreon. You can also please tell your friends. And this is something which, over at Escape Artists, the podcast company that I co-run with my partner Marguerite, who is Hi. 10 feet to my left, we say all the time. One of the most important things is word of mouth. Enthusiasm is fuel. If you like a show, tell people. Because if you tell five people, three listen to it and go, it's all right, two people will go, oh, and then it grows and grows and grows and grows. And that's how we stay supported and stay active. And it is so cool. I, I love doing this kind of work. Oh, also, uh, RQ have a Discord server. So if you want to hang out and chat to other RQ fans, it's right there. And I believe the links for this are available on the Rusty Quill website. <coughs> now... Those of you who haven't seen me stream before, uh, we have a kind of a format laid out. We normally stream Wednesday nights, um, and we do a couple of hours. We open with a, a monologue, which is kind of the equivalent of trailers at the cinema. It gives you a chance to get situated. Then we do a chunk of story, and then we close with shenanigans. Shenanigans is the Magnus Archives power hour. You're going to have a, a lot of fun with those, I think, tonight. But before that, like I say, we have the story, which is going to be the first half of Carmilla by J. Sheridan Lafanu, a vampire story that predates Dracula. Lafanu is an interesting cat. I've got some further reading for you, and also some other audio versions and free ebooks, which I'll be linking to in the After the Stream show notes. But this is one of his best known pieces, and justifiably so. There's something else you always do on Wednesday night. Oh, yeah. Everybody say hi to Chungus. Or perhaps tonight, Vampungus. <gasps> Did you really? Vampungus. He needs fangs. <coughs> now I have to make him a little cape and feathers. By the way, the amazing hat was knitted for Chungus by uh, Wendells, who's in the chat tonight. Um... Chungus is our sourdough starter, and, well, um, we talked about making Chungus when, it first, when we first started putting them together, and the chat on our own stream really liked it, and then demanded to see Chungus, and wanted regular updates on Chungus's progress. And so now we have a sourdough starter with a wardrobe. Thankfully, they're not quite at the point where they refuse to get out of their trailer without an extra set of fake beards, but I figure it's only a matter of time. This is a two-part stream. I'm sure there'll be a wardrobe change next week. You have a window, you have a, a window folks. You have seven days. I believe in you. Uh, the other thing which we do before we jump into the main story, like I said, is the opening monologue. Normally, that opening monologue is the piece of work by a good friend of ours. And they Crowley is an actual genius. He is an incredibly talented and very, very funny author. Uh, and his new book, Notes from Small Worlds, I hope it's Notes from Small Worlds, not Notes from Small Planets. It's Notes from Small Planets. Notes from Small Planets is a fantastic kind of 
Lonely Planet Travel Guide to Fiction with, edit, with added jokes and skeleton pirates. It's really, really good. This is one of his earlier books. And this is incandescently fantastic. And it is 100 of the 100 best video games that never existed. And to get us in the mood tonight, I'm going to read you what is possibly the darkest thing Nate has ever written. And I believe we should probably have a quick content warning on this, just in case. Um, content warning should be disturbing video games and blood. And? And clowns. Especially clowns. Would you let everybody know that you'll, about the after stream with links? The, I already mentioned the after stream with links, I thought. Which will include links to these books. Yes, I will, of course, also include by links to these books. Uh, we also have a request for what the sign is tonight. <coughs> Thank you, Scott. And this is Bandit. <laughs> Very Powerpuff Girls. There we go. Okay. Nine. The Clown Game. You can't talk about the arcade scene in the 1980s without mentioning this game, but not because of any commercial impact. In fact, it's increasingly rare to come across anyone who played it at all. As far as we know, there was only one cabinet which appeared in a Cleveland bar in the summer of 84. It was unmarked, save for a label bearing several kanji, which roughly translate as Burger Clown Hell Rush. It displayed only static, and it had no slot for quarters. Just a tiny metal dish. In time, Curious punters discovered that for each drop of blood left in this dish, the game would offer 10 seconds of play, and boy was it worth it. The game put you in control of a clown, dressed in red, white, and yellow, sprinting through a shattered wasteland with a savage grin on his face. As he ran, his arms would extend to grasp burgers, which he would wolf down without breaking pace. The more burgers you ate, the faster, the more inhuman the clown became until it ended up loping along on all fours, leaving a trail of flames behind it. There is only one report of the game being completed, but the ending remains unknown. Despite losing four pints of blood, the winning player elected to celebrate at a fast food restaurant, rather than a hospital, where he soon expired. The next day, the cabinet was gone, and the bar appears to have been closed for ten years. Even now, speculation abounds as to the nature of this game. Was it an art project? Black Ops marketing? A message sent from another place. Whatever the case, we're glad it never came back. The rest of the book is so much funnier, but that just seemed to fit the mood quite nicely. And also Eldritch Clown Clown Revolution is now an idea so perfect it will haunt my nightmares. Or feature frequent or <coughs> Or feature soon in a Meredith stream. One of them. Oh, just, it probably already has. Okay, before we dive into this, we have a content warning for you, and also a reminder that this is a book that was written during the Victorian era, where people were frightened of the ankles of tables, and what was acceptable is very different. So, that content warning is threat, assault of a child, racism and fat shaming in descriptions so we just wanted to warn you about that ahead of time uh, there's a query in the chat about what book is that again the core text tonight is going to be Carmilla by J Sheridan Lafanu and yes that is one of the greatest names ever the book I've just read from is the 100 best video games that never existed by Nate Crowley and like I say we'll make sure there is a buy link for this in the after show Twitter notes so, get comfy, make sure you have some water, some food, any meds that you need to take, make sure that the bedroom door is closed so that the suave lumberjack cat boy can't come and get you, right? Right? I think so. Inspiring. Okay. <laughs> Let's begin. Oh, before we do, um, this is chunky. This is going to be about 100, 100 minutes of reading, and there will be um, a break about halfway through. I'll give you about 30 seconds warning beforehand. Carmilla 
by Joseph Sheridan Lafanu. Prologue. Upon a paper attached to the narrative which follows, Dr. Heselius has written a rather elaborate note, which he accompanies with a reference to his essay on the strange subject which the MS illuminates. This mysterious subject he treats, in that essay, with his usual learning and acumen, and with remarkable directness and condensation. It will form but one volume of the series of that extraordinary man's collected papers. As I publish the case in this volume simply to interest the laity, I shall forestall the intelligent lady who relates it in nothing, and after due consideration I have determined or extract from his statement Beg pardon? I have determined, therefore, to abstain from presenting any précis of the learned doctor's reasoning. All extract from his statement on a subject which he describes as involving, not improbably, some of the profoundest arcana of our dual existence, and its immediates. I was anxious, on discovering this paper, to reopen the correspondence commenced by Dr. Heselius so many years before, with a person so clever and careful as his informant seems to have been. Much to my regret, however, I found that she had died in the interval. She probably could have added little to the narrative which she communicates in the following pages with, so far as I can pronounce, such conscientious particularity. One, an early fright. In Styria, we, though by no means magnificent people, inhabit a castle, or schloss. A small income in that part of the world goes a great way. Eight or nine hundred a year does wonders. Scantily enough, ours would have answered among wealthy people at home. My father is English. I bear an English name, although I never saw England. But here, in this lonely this primitive place, where everything is so marvellously cheap, I really don't see how ever so much money would at all materially add to our comforts, or even luxuries. My father was in the Austrian service, and retired upon a pension and his patrimony, and purchased with it this feudal residence, and the small estate on which it stands. A bargain. Nothing can be more picturesque or solitary. It stands on a slight eminence in a forest. The road, very old and narrow, passes in front of its drawbridge, never raised in my time, and its moat stocked with perch and sailed over by many swans and floating on its surface white fleets of water lilies. Over all this, the Schloss shows its many-windowed front, its towers and its Gothic chapel. The forest opens in an irregular and very picturesque glade before its gate, and at the right, a steep Gothic bridge carries the road over a stream that winds in deep shadow through the wood. I have said that this is a very lonely place. Judge whether I say truth. Looking from the hall door towards the road, the forest in which our castle stands extends 15 miles to the right and 12 to the left. The nearest inhabited village is about seven of your English miles to the left. The nearest inhabited schloss of any historic associations is that of old General Spielsdorf, nearly 20 miles away, to the right. Now, I have said the nearest inhabited village, because there is only three miles westward, that is to say, in the direction of General Spieldorf's schloss, a ruined village with its quaint little church, now roofless, in the isle of which are the mouldering tombs of the proud family of Karnstein, now extinct, who once owned the equally desolate chateau, which, in the thick of the forest, overlooks the silent ruins of the town. Respecting the cause of the desertion of this striking and melancholy spot, there is a legend which I shall relate to you another time. I must tell you now how very small is the party who constitute the inhabitants of our castle. I don't include servants, or those dependents who occupy rooms in the building attached to the schloss. Listen and wonder, my father, who is the kindest man on earth, but growing old, and I, at the date of my story, only nineteen. Eight years have passed since then. I and my father constituted the family at the schloss. My mother, 
Asterian lady, died in my infancy, but I had a good-natured governess who had been with me from, I might almost say, my infancy. I could not remember the time when her fat, benignant face was not a familiar picture in my memory. This was Madame Paradon, a native of Bern, whose care and good nature now in part supplied to me the loss of my mother, whom I do not even remember, so early it is that I lost her. She made a third at our dinner party. There was a fourth, Mademoiselle de La Fontaine, a lady such as you term, I believe, a finishing governess. She spoke French and German. Madame Paradon French and broken English, to which my father and I added English, which, partly to prevent its becoming a lost language among us, and partly from patriotic motives, we spoke every day. The consequence was a babel, at which strangers used to laugh, and which I shall make no attempt to reproduce in this narrative. And there were two or three young lady friends, besides pretty nearly of my own age, who were occasional visitors, for longer or shorter terms, and these visits I would sometimes also return. These were our regular social resources, but of course there were chance visits from neighbours of only five or six leagues distance. My life was, notwithstanding, rather a solitary one, I can assure you. My governantes had just so much control over me as you might conjecture such sage persons would have in the case of a rather spoiled girl whose only parent allowed her pretty much nearly her own way in everything. The first occurrence in my existence, which produced a terrible impression upon my mind, one which in fact has never been effaced, was one of the very earliest incidents of my life which I can recollect. Some people will think it so trifling that it should not be recorded here. You will see, however, by and by, why I mention it. The nursery, as it was called, though I had it all to myself, was a large room in the upper story of the castle with a steep oak roof. I can't have been more than six years old when one night I awoke and looked around the room from my bed and failed to see the nursery maid. Neither was my nurse there, and I thought myself alone. I was not frightened, for I was one of those happy children who are studiously kept in ignorance of ghost stories, of fairy tales, and of all such lore as makes us cover up our heads when the door cracks suddenly, or the flicker of an expiring candle makes the shadow of a bedpost dance upon the wall nearer our faces. I was vexed. I was insulted at finding myself, as I conceived, neglected, and I began to whimper preparatory to a hearty bout of roaring when, to my surprise, I saw a solemn but very pretty face looking at me from the side of the bed. It was that of a young lady who was kneeling with her hands upon the coverlet. I looked at her with a kind of pleased wonder, and I ceased whimpering. She caressed me with her hands and lay me down, and, lay then, and then lay down beside me on the bed, and drew me towards her, and she was smiling. I felt immediately delightfully soothed, and I fell asleep again. I was wakened by a sensation as if two needles ran into my breast very deep at the same moment, and I cried loudly. The lady started back with her eyes fixed on me and then slipped down upon the floor, and as I thought, hid herself under the bed. I was now, for the first time, frightened, and I yelled with all my might and main. Nurse, nursery maid, housekeeper, all came running in, and hearing my story, they made light of it, soothing me all they could meanwhile. But, child as I was, I could perceive that their faces were pale with an unwanted look of anxiety, and I saw them look under the bed and about the room and peep under tables and pluck open cupboards, and the housekeeper whispered to the nurse, Lay your hand along that hollow in the bed. Someone did lie there, so sure as you did not, the place is too warm. Content warning, accents. I remember the nursery maid petting me, and all three examining my chest, where I told them I felt the puncture, and pronouncing that there was no sign visible that any such things had happened to me. The housekeeper and the two other servants who were in charge of the nursery remained sitting up all night, and from that time a servant always sat up in the nursery, until I was about fourteen. I was very nervous for a long time, after this. A doctor was called in. He was pallid and elderly. 
How well I remember his long satin face, slightly pitted with smallpox and his chestnut wig. For a good while, every second day, he came and, he came and gave me medicine, which of course I hated. The morning after I saw this apparition, I was in a state of terror, and I could not bear to be left alone, daylight though it was, for even a moment. I remember my father coming up and standing at the bedside and talking cheerfully, and asking the nurse a number of questions and laughing very heartily at one of the answers, and patting me on the shoulder and kissing me, and telling me not to be frightened, that it was nothing but a dream, and could not hurt me. But I was not comforted, for I knew the visit of the strange woman was not a dream, and I was awfully frightened. I was a little consoled by the nursery maids assuring me that it was she who had come and looked at me, and lain down beside me in the bed, and that I must have been half dreaming not to have known her face. But this, though supported by the nurse, did not quite satisfy me. I remembered in the course of that day a venerable old man in a black cassock coming into the room with a nurse and housekeeper and talking a little to them, and very kindly to me. His face was very sweet and gentle, and he told me they were going to pray, and joined my hands together, and desired me to say softly, while they were praying, Lord, hear all good prayers for us, for Jesus' sake. I think these were the very words, for I often repeated them to myself, and my nurse used for years to make me say them in my prayers. I remembered so well the thoughtful, sweet face of that white-haired old man in his black cassock as he stood in that rude, lofty, brown room with the clumsy furniture of a fashion three hundred years old about him, and the scanty light entering its shadowy atmosphere through the small lattice. He kneeled, and the three women with him, and he prayed aloud with an earnest, quavering voice for what seemed to me to be an awfully long time. I forget all my life preceding that event, and for some time after it. It is also obscure, but the scenes I have just described stand out vivid as the isolated pictures of the phantasmagoria surrounded by darkness. Phantasmagoria surrounded by darkness is the name of my Sisters of Mercy cover band. <laughs> <coughs> Eldritch, thank you in particular for Pallet Doctor Detected, Security Alerted. Chapter 2 A Guest I am now going to tell you something so strange that it will require all your faith in my veracity to believe my story. It is not only true, nevertheless, but truth of which I have been an eye witness. It was a sweet summer evening, and my father asked me, as he sometimes did, to take a little ramble with him along that beautiful forest vista, which I have mentioned as lying in front of the schloss. General Spielsdorf cannot come to us as soon as I had hoped, said my father, as we pursued our walk. He was to have paid us a visit of some weeks, and we had expected his arrival next day. He was to have brought with him a young lady, his niece and ward, Mademoiselle Reinfeldt, whom I had never seen but whom I had heard described as a very charming girl, and in whose society I had promised myself many happy days. I was more disappointed than a young lady living in a town or a bustling neighbourhood can possibly imagine. This visit and the new acquaintance it promised had furnished my daydreams for weeks. And how soon does he come? I asked. Not till autumn. Not for two months, I dare say, he answered. And I am very glad now, dear, that you never knew Mademoiselle Reinfeldt. And why? I asked, both mortified and curious. Because the poor young lady is dead, he replied. I quite forgot I had not told you, but you were not in the room when I received the General's letter this evening. I was very much shocked. General Spielsdorf had mentioned in his first letter, six or seven weeks before, that she was not so well as he would wish her, but there was nothing to suggest the remotest suspicion of danger. Here is the General's letter said, handing it to me. I am afraid he is in great affliction. The letter appears to me to have been written very nearly in distraction. We sat down on a rude bench under a group of magnificent lime trees. The sun was setting with all its melancholy splendour behind the sylvan horizon, 
from the stream that flows beside our home and passes under the steep old bridge I have mentioned wound through many a group of noble trees, almost at our feet, reflecting in its current the fading crimson of the sky. General Spieldorf's letter was so extraordinary, so vehement, in some places so self-contradictory, that I read it twice over, the second time aloud to my father, and was still unable to account for it, except by supposing that grief had somehow unsettled his mind. It said, I have lost my darling daughter, for as such, for as such I loved her. During the last days of dear Bertha's illness, I was not able to write to you. Before then, I had no idea of her danger. I have lost her. I have lost her and now learn all. Too late. She died in the peace of innocence and in the glorious hope of a blessed futurity. The fiend who betrayed our infatuated hospitality has done it all. I thought I was receiving into my house innocence, gaiety, a charming companion for my lost Bertha. Heavens, what a fool I have been. I thank God my child died without a suspicion of the cause of her sufferings. She is gone without so much as conjecturing the nature of her illness and the accursed passion of the agent of all this misery. I devote my remaining days to tracking and extinguishing a monster. I am told I may hope to accomplish my righteous and merciful purpose. At present there is scarcely a gleam of light to guide me. I curse my conceited incredulity, my despicable affection of superiority, my blindness, my obstinacy, all too late. I cannot write or talk collectedly now. I am distracted. So soon as I shall have a little recovered, I mean to devote myself to a time of inquiry, which may possibly lead me as far as Vienna. Sometime in the autumn, two months hence or earlier, if I live, I will see you, that is, if you permit me. I will then tell you all that I scarce dare put upon paper now. So well. Pray for me, dear friend. In these terms ended this strange letter. Though I had never seen Bertha Reinfeldt, my eyes filled with tears at the sudden intelligence. I was startled as well as profoundly disappointed. The sun had now set, and it was twilight by the time I had returned the general's letter to my father. It was a soft, clear evening, and we loitered, speculating upon the possible meanings of the violent, incoherent sentences which I had just been reading. We had nearly a mile to walk before reaching the road that passes the Schloss in front, and by that time the moon was shining brilliantly. At the drawbridge we met Madame Paradon and Mademoiselle de La Fontaine, who had come out without their bonnets to enjoy the exquisite moonlight. We heard their voices gabbling in animated dialogue as we approached. We joined them at the drawbridge and turned about to admire with them the beautiful scene. The glade through which we had just walked lay before us. At our left, the narrow road wound away under clumps of lordly trees and was lost to sight amid the thickening forest. At the right, the same road crosses the steep and picturesque bridge, near which stands a ruined tower which once guarded that pass. And beyond the bridge, an abrupt eminence rises, covered with trees, and showing in the shadows some grey, ivy-clustered rocks. Over the sward and low grounds, the thin film of mist was stealing like smoke, marking the distances with a transparent veil, and here and there we could see the river faintly flashing in the moonlight. No softer, sweeter scene could be imagined. The news I had just heard made it melancholy, but nothing could disturb its character of profound serenity and the enchanted glory and vagueness of the prospect. My father who enjoyed the picturesque, and I stood looking in silence over the expanse beneath us. The two good governesses, standing a little way behind us, discoursed upon the scene and were eloquent upon the moon. <coughs> Madame Peridon was fat, middle-aged and romantic, and talked and sighed poetically. Mademoiselle de La Fontaine, in right of her father, who was a German, assumed to be psychological, metaphysical and something of a mystic now declared that when the moon shone with a light so intense, it was well known that it indicated a special spiritual activity. The effect of the full moon in such a state of brilliancy was manifold. It acted on dreams, it acted on lunacy, it acted on nervous people. It had marvellous physical influences connected with life. 
Mademoiselle related that her cousin, who was mate of a merchant ship, having taken a nap on deck on such a night, lying on his back, with his face full in the light of the moon, had wakened after a dream of an old woman clawing him by the cheek, with his features horribly drawn to one side, and his countenance had never quite recovered its equilibrium. This night, she said, the moon, this night, she said, is full of idyllic and the magnetic influence, and see, when you look behind you at the front of the schloss, how all its windows flash and twinkle with that silvery splendor, as if unseen hands had lighted up the rooms to receive fairy guests. There are indolent styles of the spirits in which, indisposed to talk ourselves, the talk of others is pleasant to our listless ears, and I gazed on, pleased with the tinkle of the ladies' conversation. I've got into one of my moping moods tonight, said my father, after a silence, and quoting Shakespeare, whom, by way of keeping up our English, he used to read aloud. He said, In truth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. But how I got it, came by it. I forget the rest, but I feel as if some great misfortune were hanging over us. I suppose the poor general's afflicted letter has had something to do with this. At this moment, the unwanted sound of carriage wheels and many hoofs upon the road arrested our attention. There seemed to be approaching from the high ground overlooking the bridge, and very soon the equipage emerged from that point, two horsemen first crossing the bridge, then came a carriage drawn by four horses and two men behind. It seemed to be the travelling carriage of a person of rank, and we were all immediately absorbed in watching that very unusual spectacle. It became, in a few moments, greatly more interesting, for just as the carriage had passed the summit of the steep bridge, one of the leaders, taking fright, communicated his panic to the rest, and after a plunge or two, the whole team broke into a wild gallop together, and dashing between the horsemen who rode in front, came thundering along the road towards us with the speed of a hurricane. The excitement of the scene was made more painful by the clear, long-drawn screams of a female voice from the carriage window. We all advanced in curiosity and horror, me rather in silence, the rest with various ejaculations of terror. Moving on. Our suspense did not last long. Just before you reach the castle drawbridge on the route they were coming, there stands by the roadside a magnificent lime tree. On the other, stands, on the other side stands an ancient stone cross at sight of which the horses, now going at a pace that was perfectly frightful, swerved so as to bring a wheel over the projecting roots of the tree. I knew what was coming. I covered my eyes, unable to see it out, and turned my head away at the same moment as I heard a cry from my lady friends who had gone on a little. Curiosity opened my eyes, and I saw a scene of utter confusion. Two of the horses were on the ground, the carriage lay upon its side with two wheels in the air. The men were busy removing the traces, and a lady with a commanding air and figure had got out and stood with clasped hands, raising the handkerchief that was in them every now and then to her eyes. Through the carriage door was now lifted a young lady, who appeared to be lifeless. My dear old father was already beside the elder lady, his hat in his hand, evidently tendering his aid and the resources of his schloss. The lady did not appear to hear him, or to have eyes for anything but the slender girl who was being placed against the slope of the bank. I approached. The young lady was apparently stunned, but she was certainly not dead. My father, who piqued himself on being something of a physician, had just had his fingers on her wrist and assured the lady, who had declared herself her mother, that her pulse, though faint and irregular, was undoubtedly still distinguishable. The lady clasped her hands and looked upwards, as if in a momentary transport of gratitude, but immediately she broke out again in that theatrical way which is, I believe, natural to some people. <coughs> she was what is called a fine-looking woman for her time of life, and must have been handsome. She was tall, but not thin dressed in black velvet and looked rather pale, but with a proud and commanding countenance, though now agitated strangely. 
Who was ever born to such calamity? I heard her say with clasped hands as I came up. Here am I, on a journey of life and death, in prosecuting which to lose an hour is possibly to lose all. My child will not have recovered sufficiently to resume her route, for who can say how long? I must leave her. I cannot, dare not delay. How far on, sir, can you tell? Is the nearest village. I must leave her there, and shall not see my darling or even hear of it till my return. Three months hence. I plucked my father by the coat and whispered earnestly in his ear, Oh, papa, pray ask her to let her stay with us. It would be so delightful. Do pray. If madam will entrust her child to the care of my daughter and of her good governante, Madame Peridon, and permit her to remain as our guest under my charge until her return, it will confer a distinction and an obligation upon us, and we shall treat her with all the care and devotion which so sacred a trust deserves. I cannot do that, sir. It would be to task your kindness and chivalry too cruelly, said the lady distractedly. It would, on the contrary, be to confer on us a very great kindness at the moment when we most need it. My daughter has just been disappointed by a cruel misfortune in a visit from which she had long anticipated a great deal of happiness. If you confide this young lady to our care, it will be her best consolation. The nearest village on your route is distant, and affords no such inn as you could think of placing your daughter at. You cannot allow her to continue her journey for any considerable distance without danger. If, as you say, you cannot suspend your journey, you must part with her tonight, and nowhere could you do so with more honest assurances of care and tenderness than here. There was something in this lady's air and appearance so distinguished, even imposing, and in her manner so engaging, as to impress one, quite apart from the dignity of her equipage, with a conviction that she was a person of consequence. By this time the carriage was replaced in its upright position, and the horses quite tractable in the traces again. The lady threw on her daughter a glance which I fancied was not quite so affectionate as one might have anticipated from the beginning of the scene. Then she beckoned slightly to my father, and withdrew two or three steps with him out of hearing, and talked to him with a fixed and stern countenance, not at all like that with which she had hitherto spoken. I was filled with wonder. Wonder that my father did not seem to perceive the change, but also unspeakably curious to learn what it could be that she was speaking, almost in his ear, with such earnestness, such rapidity. Two or three minutes at most, I think, she remained thus employed. Then she turned, and a few steps brought her to where her daughter lay, supported by Madame Peridon. She kneeled beside her for a moment and whispered, as Madame supposed, a little benediction in her ear. Then, hastily kissing her, she stepped into her carriage. The door was closed. The footmen in stately liveries jumped up behind. The outriders spurred on the postilions, cracked their whips. The horses plunged and broke suddenly into a furious canter, and it all threatened soon again to become a gallop as the carriage whirled away, followed at the same rapid pace by the two horsemen in the rear. See, it's fine. Here, have a free girl. What could possibly go wrong? People have pointed out how this has very similar structural beats to Twilight. I'm, I'm sure the, the two stories have absolutely no resemblance. Moving on. Chapter three. Chapter three. We compare notes. We followed the cortege with our eyes until it was swiftly lost to sight in the misty wood and the very sound of the hoofs and the wheels died away in the silent night air. Nothing remained to assure us that the adventure had not been an illusion of a moment, but the young lady, who just at that moment opened her eyes. I could not see, for her face was turned from me, but she raised her head, evidently looked about her, and I heard a very sweet voice ask complainingly, Where is Mamma? Our good Madame Peridon answered tenderly and added some comfortable assurances. I then heard her ask, Where am I? What is this place? And after that she said, I, I don't see the carriage. And Matska, where is she? Madame answered all her questions insofar as she understood them, and gradually the lady remembered how the misadventure came about, and was glad to hear that no one in, or in attendance on, the carriage was hurt. 
and on learning that her mamma had left her here till her return in about three months. She wept. Sensible. Uh, sensible. <laughs> Have a good time, love. I'm off. <laughs> See you in three months. Um, I was going to add my consolations to those of Madame Paradon when Mademoiselle de La Fontaine placed her hand upon my arm, saying, Don't approach. One at a time is as much as she can at present to converse with. A very little excitement would possibly overpower her now. As soon as she is comfortably in bed, I thought, I will run up to her room and see her. My father, in the meantime, had sent a servant on horseback for the physician, who lived about two leagues away, and a bedroom was being prepared for the young lady's reception. The stranger now rose, and, leaning on Madame's arm, walked slowly over the drawbridge and into the castle gate. In the hall, servants waited to receive her, and she was conducted forthwith to her room. The room we usually sat in as our drawing room is long, having four windows that looked over the moat and drawbridge upon the very forest scene I have just described. It is furnished in old carved oak, with large carved cabinets, and the chairs are cushioned with, cri with crimson Utrecht velvet. The walls are covered with tapestry, and surrounded with great gold frames, the figures being as large as life in ancient and very curious costume, and the subjects represented are hunting, hawking, and generally festive. It is not too stately to be extremely comfortable, and here we had our tea, for, with his usual patriotic leanings, Papa insisted that the national beverage should make its appearance regularly, alongside our coffee and our chocolate. We sat here this night, and with candles lighted, were talking over the adventure of the evening. Madame Peridon and Mademoiselle de La Fontaine were both of our party. The young stranger had hardly lain down in her bed when she sank into a deep sleep, and these ladies had left her in the care of a servant. How do you like our guest? I asked as soon as Madame entered. Tell me all about her. Oh, I like her extremely, answered Madame. She is, I almost think, the prettiest creature I ever saw. About your age, and so gentle and nice. She is absolutely beautiful, threw in Mademoiselle, who had be beeped for a moment into the stranger's room. And such a sweet voice, added Madame Paradon. Did you remark a woman in the carriage after it was set up again, who did not get out? inquired Mademoiselle, but only looked from the window. No, we had not seen her. Then she described a hideous black woman, with a sort of coloured turban on her head, and who was gazing all the time from the carriage window, nodding and grinning derisively towards the ladies, with gleaming eyes and large white eyeballs, and her teeth set as if in fury. Yeah. Content warning galore. <coughs> Did you remark what an ill-looking pack of men the servants were? asked Madame. Yes, said my father, who had just come in. Ugly, hangdog-looking fellows as ever I beheld in my life. I hope they mayn't rob the poor lady in the forest. They are clever rogues, however. They got everything to rights in a minute. I dare... pardon me. I dare say they are worn out with too long travelling, said madame. Besides looking wicked, their faces were so strangely lean and dark and sullen. I am very curious. I... Oh, but I dare say the young lady will tell you all about it tomorrow, if she is sufficiently recovered. I don't think she will, said my father, with a mysterious smile and a little nod of his head, as if he knew more about it than he cared to tell us. This made us all the more inquisitive as to what had passed between him and the lady in the black velvet, in the brief but earnest interview that had immediately preceded her departure. We were scarcely alone when I entreated him to tell me, he did not need much pressing. There's no particular reason I should not tell you. She expressed a reluctance to trouble us with the care of her daughter, saying she was in delicate health and nervous, but not subject to any kind of seizure. She volunteered that, nor to, nor to any illusion, being, in fact, perfectly sane. How very odd to say all that, I interpolated. It was so unnecessary. At all events, it was said... He laughed, and as you wish to know all that passed, which was indeed very little, I tell you. She then said, I am making a long journey of vital importance. She emphasized that word, rapid and secret. I shall return for my child in three months. 
In the meantime, she will be silent as to who we are, whence we come, and whither we are traveling. That is all she said. She spoke very pure French when she said the word secret. She paused for a few seconds and looked sternly, her eyes fixed on mine. I fancy she makes a great point of that. You saw how quickly she was gone. I hope I have not done a very foolish thing in taking charge of the young lady. For my part, I was delighted. I was longing to see and talk to her, and only waiting till the doctor should give me leave. You, who live in towns, can have no idea how great an event the introduction of a new friend is in such a solitude as surrounded us. The doctor did not arrive till nearly one o'clock, but I could no more have gone to my bed and slept than I could have overtaken, on foot, the carriage in which the princess in black velvet had driven away. When the physician came down to the drawing room, it was to report very favourably upon his patient. She was now sitting up, her pulse quite regular, apparently perfectly well. She had sustained no injury, and the little shock to her nerves had passed away quite harmlessly. There could be no harm, certainly, in seeing her. If we both wished it, and with this permission, I sent forthwith to know whether she would allow me to visit her for a few minutes in her room. The servant returned immediately to say that she desired nothing more. You may be sure I was not long in availing myself of this permission. Our visitor lay in one of the handsomest rooms in the Schloss. It was perhaps a little stately. There was a sombre piece of tapestry opposite the foot of the bed, representing Cleopatra with the asps to her bosom, and other solemn classic scenes were displayed, a little faded, upon the other walls. But there was gold carving and rich and varied colour enough in the other decorations of the room to more than redeem the gloom of the old tapestry. There were candles at the bedside. Our guest was sitting up, her slender, pretty figure enveloped in the soft silk dressing gown, embroidered with flowers and lined with thick quilted silk which her mother had thrown over her feet as she lay upon the ground. What was it that, as I reached the bedside and had just begun my little greeting, struck me dumb in a moment, and made me recoil a step or two from before her? I will tell you. I saw the very face which had visited me in my childhood at night, which remained so fixed in my memory which I had for so many years so often ruminated with horror when no one suspected of what I was thinking. It was pretty, even beautiful, and when I first beheld it wore the same melancholy expression, but this almost instantly lighted into a strange, fixed smile of recognition. There was a silence of fully a minute, and then at length she spoke, I could not. How wonderful, she exclaimed. Twelve years ago I saw your face in a dream, and it has haunted me ever since. Wonderful indeed, I repeated, overcoming with an effort the horror that had for a time suspended my utterances. Twelve years ago, in vision or reality, I certainly saw you. I could not forget your face. It has remained before my eyes ever since. Her smile had softened. Whatever I had fancied strange in it was gone, and it and her dimpling cheeks were now delightfully pretty and intelligent. I felt reassured and continued more in the vein which hospitality indicated to bid her welcome and to tell her how much pleasure her accidental arrival had given us all, and especially what a happiness it was to me. I took her hand as I spoke. I was a little shy, as lonely people are, but the situation made me eloquent, even bold. She pressed my hand, she laid hers upon it, and her eyes glowed as, looking hastily into mine, she smiled again, and blushed. She answered my welcome very prettily. I sat down beside her, still wondering, and she said, I must tell you my vision about you. It is so very strange that you and I should have had each of the other so vivid a dream that each should have seen, I you, and you me, looking as we do now, when of course we both were mere children. I was a child, about six years old, and I awoke from a confused, troubled dream, 
and found myself in a room unlike my nursery, wainscotted clumsily in some dark wood and with cupboards and bedsteads and chairs and benches placed all about it. The beds were, I thought, all empty, and the room itself without anyone but myself in it, and I, after looking about me for some time, and admiring especially an iron candlestick with two branches, which I should certainly know again, crept under one of the beds to reach the window. But as I got from under the bed, I heard someone crying and looking up while I was still upon my knees. I saw you. Most assuredly, you. As I see you now, a beautiful young lady with golden hair and large blue eyes and lips, your lips, you as you are here. Your looks won me. I climbed on the bed and put my arms about you and I think we both fell asleep. I was aroused by a scream. You were sitting up screaming. I was frightened and slipped down upon the ground and it seemed to me lost consciousness for a moment. And when I came to myself, I was again in my nursery at home. Your face I have never forgotten since. I could not be misled by mere resemblance. You are the lady whom I saw then. It was now my turn to relate my corresponding vision, which I did to the undisguised wonder of my new acquaintance. I don't know which should be most afraid of the other, she said again, smiling. If you were less pretty, I should be very much afraid of you, but being as you are, and you and I both so young... I feel only that I have made your acquaintance twelve years ago, and have already a right to your intimacy. At all events, it does seem as if we were destined from our earliest childhood to be friends. I wonder, do you feel as strangely drawn towards me as I to you? I have never had a friend. Shall I find one now? She sighed, and her fine, dark eyes gazed passionately on me. Now the truth is, I felt rather unaccountably towards the beautiful stranger. I did feel, as she said, drawn towards her, but there was also something of repulsion. In this ambiguous feeling, however, the sense of attraction immensely prevailed. She interested, she won me, she was so beautiful, so indescribably engaging. I perceive now something of languor and exhaustion stealing over her, and hastened to bid her good night. The doctor thinks, I added, that you ought to have a maid to sit up with you tonight. One of ours is waiting, and you will find her a very useful and quiet creature. How kind of you, but I could not sleep. I never could with an attendant in the room. I shan't require any assistance, and shall I confess my weakness? I am haunted with a terror of robbers. Our house was robbed once, and two servants murdered, so I always lock my door. It has become a habit, and you look so kind, I know you will forgive me. I see there is a key in the lock. She held me close in her pretty arms for a moment, and whispered in my ear, Good night, darling. It is very hard to part with you, but good night. Tomorrow, but not early. I shall see you again. She sank back on the pillow with a sigh and her fine eyes followed me with a fond and melancholy gaze, and she murmured again, Good night, dear friend. Young people like, and even love, on impulse. I was flattered by the evident, though as yet undeserved, fondness she showed me. I liked the confidence with which she at once received me. She was determined that we should be very near friends. Next day came, and we met again. I was delighted with my companion, that is to say, in many respects. Her looks lost nothing in daylight. She was certainly the most beautiful creature I had ever seen, and the unpleasant remembrance of the face presented in my early dream had lost the effects of the first unexpected recognition. She confessed that she had experienced a similar shock on seeing me, and precisely the same faint antipathy that had mingled with my admiration of her. We now laughed together over our momentary horrors. Chapter 4 her habits, a saunter. 
I told you that I was charmed with her in most particulars. There were some that did not please me so well. She was above the middle height of women. I shall begin by describing her. She was slender and wonderfully graceful, except that her movements were languid, very languid. Indeed, there was nothing in her appearance to indicate an invalid. Her complexion was rich and brilliant. Her features were small and beautifully formed. Her eyes large, dark, lustrous. Her hair was quite wonderful. I never saw hair so magnificently thick and long when it was down about her shoulders. I have often placed my hand under it and laughed with wonder at its weight. It was so fine and soft and in colour a rich, very dark brown with something of gold. I loved to let it down, tumbling with its own weight as, in her room, she lay back in her chair, talking in her low, sweet voice. I used to fold and braid it, and spread it out and play with it. Heavens, if I had but known all. I said there were particulars which did not please me. I have told you that her confidence won me the first night I saw her, but I found that she exercised with respect to herself, her mother, her history, everything, in fact, connected with her life, plans and people, an ever-wakeful reserve. I dare say I was unreasonable. Perhaps I was wrong. I dare say I ought to have respected the solemn injunction laid upon my father by the stately lady in black velvet, but curiosity is a restless and unscrupulous passion, and no one girl can endure with patience that hers should be baffled by another. What harm could it do anyone to tell me what I so ardently desired to know? Had she no trust in my good sense or honour? Why would she not believe me when I assured her so solemnly that I would not divulge one syllable of what she told me to any mortal breathing? There was a coldness, it seemed to me, beyond her years, in her smiling, melancholy, persistent refusal to afford me the least ray of light. I cannot say we quarrelled upon this point, for she would not quarrel upon any. It was, of course, terribly unfair of me to press her, very ill-bred, but I really could not help it, and I might just as well have left it alone. What she did tell me amounted, in my unconscionable estimation, to nothing. It was all summed up in three very vague disclosures. First, her name was Carmilla. Second, her family was very ancient and noble. Third, her home lay in the direction of the West. She would not tell me the name of her family, nor their armorial bearings, nor the name of their estate, nor even that of the country they lived in. You are not to suppose that I worried her incessantly on these subjects. I watched opportunity and rather insinuated than urged my inquiries. Once or twice, indeed, I did attack her more directly, but no matter what my tactics, utter failure was invariably the result. Reproaches and caresses were all lost upon her, but I must add this, that her evasion was conducted with so pretty a melancholy and deprecation, with so many and even passionate declarations of her liking for me, and trust in my honour, and with so many promises that I should at last know all, that I could not find it in my heart to long be offended with her. She used to place her pretty arms about my neck, draw me to her, and laying her cheek to mine, murmur with her lips near my ear, Dearest, your little heart is wounded. Think me not cruel, because I obey the irresistible law of my strength and weakness. If your dear heart is wounded, my wild heart bleeds with yours. In the rapture of my enormous humiliation, I live in your warm life, and you shall die, die, sweetly die, into mine. I cannot help it. As I draw near to you, you, in your turn, will draw near to others, and learn the rapture of that cruelty which yet is love. So, for a while, seek to know no more of me and mine, but trust me with all your loving spirit. And when she had spoken such a rhapsody, she would press me more closely in her trembling embrace, and her lips in soft kisses gently glow upon my cheek. Her agitations, her language, were unintelligible to me. From these foolish embraces, which were not of very frequent occurrence, I must allow, I used to wish to extricate myself, but my energies seemed to fail me. 
Her murmured words sounded like a lullaby in my ear and soothed my resistance into a trance from which I only seemed to recover myself when she withdrew her arms. In these mysterious moods, I did not like her. I experienced a strange, tumultuous excitement that was pleasurable ever and anon, mingled with a vain sense of fear, disgust. I had no distinct thoughts about how well such scenes lasted, but I was conscious of a love growing into adoration and also of abhorrence. This I know is paradox, but I can make no other attempt to explain the feeling. I now write, after an interval of more than ten years, with a trembling hand, with a confused and horrible recollection of certain occurrences and situations in the ordeal through which I was unconsciously passing, though with a vivid and a very sharp remembrance of the main current of my story. But, I suspect in all lives, there are certain emotional scenes, those in which our passions have been most wildly and terribly roused, that are, of all others, the most vaguely and dimly remembered. Sometimes, after an hour of apathy, my strange and beautiful companion would take my hand and hold it with a fond pressure renewed again and again, blushing softly, gazing in my face with those languid, burning eyes and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with a tumultuous respiration. It was like the ardour of a lover. It embarrassed me. It was hateful and yet overpowering, and with gloating eyes she drew me to her, and her hot lips travelled along my cheek in kisses, and she would whisper, almost in sobs, You are mine. You shall be mine. You and I are one forever. Then she had thrown herself back in her chair, with her small hands over her eyes, leaving me trembling. Are we related? I used to ask. What can you mean by all this? I remind you perhaps of someone whom you love, but you must not. I hate it. I don't know you. I don't know myself when you look so and talk so. She used to sigh at my vehemence, then turn away and drop my hand. Respecting these very extraordinary manifestations, I strove in vain to form any satisfactory theory. I could not refer them to affectation or trick. It was unmistakably the momentary breaking out of suppressed instinct and emotion. Was she, notwithstanding her mother's volunteered denial, subject to brief visitations of insanity? Or was there here a disguise and a romance? I had read in old storybooks of such things. What if a boyish lover had found his way into the house and sought to prosecute his suit in masquerade with the assistance of a clever old adventuress? But there were many things against this hypothesis, highly interesting as it was to my vanity. I could boast of no little attentions such as masculine gallantry delights to offer. Between these passionate moments there were long intervals of commonplace, of gaiety, of brooding melancholy, during which, except that I detected her eyes so full of melancholy fire following me at times, I might have been as nothing to her. Except in these brief periods of mysterious excitement, her ways were girlish, and there was always a languor about them, quite incompatible with a masculine system in a state of health. In some respects, her habits were odd. Perhaps not so singular in the opinion of a town lady like you, as they appeared to us rustic folks. She used to come down very late, generally not till one o'clock. She would then take a cup of chocolate, but eat nothing. We then went out for a walk, which was a mere saunter, and she seemed almost immediately exhausted, and either returned to the schloss or sat on one of the benches that were placed here and there among the trees. This was a bodily languor in which her mind did not sympathise. She was always an animated talker, and very intelligent. She sometimes alluded for a moment to her own home, or mentioned an adventure or situation or an early recollection which indicated a group of people of strange manners and described customs of which we knew nothing. I gathered from these chance hints that her native country was much more remote than I had at first fancied. As we sat thus one afternoon under the trees, a funeral passed us by. It was that of a pretty young girl whom I had often seen, the daughter of one of the rangers of the forest. The poor man was walking behind the coffin of his darling. 
She was his only child. He looked heartbroken. Peasants walking two and two came behind. They were singing a funeral hymn. I rose to mark my respect as they passed and joined in the hymn they were very sweetly singing. My companion shook me a little roughly when I turned surprised. She said brusquely, Don't you perceive how discordant that is? I find it very sweet. On the contrary, I answered, vexed at the interruption and very uncomfortable, lest the people who composed this little procession should observe and resent what was passing. I resumed, therefore, instantly, and was again interrupted. You pierce my ears, said Carmilla, almost angrily, and stopping her ears with her tiny fingers. <coughs> Besides, how can you tell that your religion and mine are the same? Your forms wound me. I hate funerals. What a fuss. Why, you must die. Everyone must die. And all the happier when they do. Come home. My father has gone on with the clergyman to the churchyard. I thought you knew she was to be buried today. She? I don't trouble my head about peasants. I don't know who she is, answered Carmilla with a flash from her fine eyes. She is the poor girl who fancied she saw a ghost a fortnight ago and has been dying ever since, till yesterday when she expired. Tell me nothing about ghosts. I shan't sleep tonight if you do. I hope there is no plague or fever coming. All well, this looks very like it, I continued. The swineherd's young wife died only a week ago, and she thought something seized her by the throat as she lay in her bed, and nearly strangled her. Papa says such horrible fancies do accompany some forms of fever. She was quite well the day before. She sank afterwards, and died before a week. Well, her funeral is over, I hope, and her hymn sung, and her ears shouldn't be tortured with that discord and jargon. It has made me nervous. Sit down here beside me. Sit close. Hold my hand. Press it. Press it hard. Harder. We had moved a little back and had come to another seat. She sat down. Her face underwent a change that alarmed and even terrified me for a moment. It darkened, became horribly livid. Her teeth and hands were clenched and she frowned and compressed her lips while she stared down upon the ground at her feet and trembled all over with a continuous shudder as irrepressible as ague. All her energies seemed to strain to suppress a fit, with which she was then breathlessly tugging, and at length a low convulsive cry of suffering broke from her, and gradually the hysteria subsided. There, that comes of strangling people with hymns, she said at last. Hold me, hold me still, it is passing away. And so gradually it did. And perhaps to dissipate the sombre impression which the spectacle had left upon me, she became unusually animated and chatty. And so we got home. This was the first time I had seen her exhibit any definable symptoms of that delicacy of health which her mother had spoken of. It was the first time also I had seen her exhibit anything like temper. Both passed away like a summer cloud, and never but once afterwards did I witness on her part a momentary sign of anger. I will tell you how it happened. She and I were looking out of one of the long drawing room windows when there entered the courtyard over the drawbridge a figure of a wanderer whom I knew very well. He used to visit the Schloss generally twice a year. It was the figure of a hunchback, with the sharp, lean features that generally accompany deformity. He wore a pointed black beard, and he was smiling from ear to ear, showing his white fangs. He was dressed in buff, black, and scarlet, and crossed with more straps and belts than I could count, from which hung all manner of things. Behind, he carried a magic lantern and two boxes, which I well knew, in one of which was a salamander, and the other a mandrake. These monsters used to make my father laugh. They were compounded of parts of monkeys, parrots, squirrels, fish, and hedge hedgehogs, dried and stitched together with great neatness and startling effect. He had a fiddle, a box of conjuring apparatus, a pair of foils and masks attached to his belt, several other mysterious cases dangling about him, and a black staff with copper ferrules in his hand. His companion was a rough, spare dog that followed at his heels but stopped short suspiciously at the drawbridge. And in a while, 
began to howl dismally. In the meantime, the mountebank, standing in the midst of the courtyard, raised his grotesque hat and made us a very ceremonious bow, paying his compliments very volubly in execrable French and German, but not much better. Then, disengaging his fiddle, he began to scrape a lively air to which he sang with a merry discord, dancing with ludicrous airs and activity that made me laugh in spite of the dog's howlings. Then he advanced to the window with many smiles and salutations, and his hat in his left hand, his fiddle under his arm, and with a fluency that never took breath, he gabbled a long advertisement of all his accomplishments and the resources of the various arts which he placed at our service, and the curiosities and entertainments which it was within his power, at our bidding, to display. Will your ladyships be pleased to buy an amulet against the Upire, which is going like the wolf I hear through these woods, he said, dropping his hat on the pavement. They are dying of it right and left, and here is a charm that never fails, only pinned to the pillow, and you may laugh in his face. These charms consisted of oblong strips of vellum with cabalistic ciphers and diagrams upon them. Carmilla instantly purchased one. So did I. He was looking up, and we were smiling down upon him, amused, at least. I can answer for myself. His piercing black eye, as he looked up in our faces, seemed to detect something that fixed, for a moment, his curiosity. In an instant, he unrolled a leather case, full of all manner of odd little steel instruments. See here, my lady, he said, displaying it and addressing me. I profess, among other things less useful, the art of dentistry. Plague take the dog, he interpolated. Silence, beast! He howls so that your ladyships can scarcely hear a word. Your noble friend, the young lady at your right, has the sharpest tooth, long, thin, pointed like an awl, like a needle. <laughs> With my sharp and long sight, as I look up, I have seen it distinctly. Now, if it happens to hurt the young lady, and I think it must, here am I, here are my file, my punch, my nippers. I will make it round and blunt, if her ladyship pleases. No longer the tooth of a fish, but of a beautiful young lady as she is. Oh, is the young lady displeased? Have I been too bold? Have I offended her? The young lady indeed looked very angry as she drew back from the window. How dares that mountebank insult us so? Where is your father? I shall demand redress from him. My father would have had the wretch tied up to the pump and flogged with a cart whip and burnt to the bones with the cattle brand. She retired from the window a step or two and sat down and had largely lost sight of the offender when her wrath subsided as suddenly as it had risen and she gradually recovered her usual tone and seemed to forget the little hunchback and his follies. My father was out of spirits that evening. On coming in, he told us that there had been another case, very similar to the two fatal ones, which had lately occurred. The sister of a young peasant on his estate, only a mile away, was very ill, had been, as she described it, attacked very nearly in the same way, and was now slowly, but steadily, sinking. All this, said my father, is strictly referable to natural causes. These poor people infect one another with their superstitions, and so repeat in imagination the images of terror that have infested their neighbours. But that very circumstance frightens one horribly, said Carmilla. How so? inquired my father. I am so afraid of fancying I see such things, I think it would be bad as reality. We are in God's hands. Nothing can happen without his permission, and all will end well for those who love him. He is our faithful creator. He has made us all. And we will take he and will take care of us. Creator, nature, said the young lady in answer to my gentle father. And this disease that invades the country is natural. Nature, all things proceed from nature, don't they? All things in the heaven, in the earth, and under the earth, act and live as nature ordains. I think so. The doctor said he would come around today, said my father. I want to know what he thinks about it and what he thinks we had better do. Doctors never did me any good, said Carmilla. Then you have been ill, I asked, more ill than you ever were. She answered, long ago, yes, a long time. I had suffered from this very illness, but I forgot all but my pain and weakness, and they were not so bad as I suffered in other diseases. You were very young then, I dare say. Let us talk no more of it. You would not wound a friend. 
She looked languidly in my eyes and passed her arm round my waist lovingly and led me out of the room. My father was busy over some papers near the window. Why does your papa like to frighten us? said the pretty girl with a sigh and a little shudder. He doesn't, dear Carmilla. It is the very furthest thing from his mind. You afraid, dearest? I should be very much if I fancied there was any real danger of my being attacked as those poor people were. You are afraid to die? Yes, everyone is. But to die as lovers may, to die together, so that they may live together. Girls are caterpillars while they live in the world, to be finally butterflies when the summer comes, but in the meantime there are grubs and larvae, don't you see? Each with their peculiar propensities, necessities, structure, so says Monsieur Buffon in his big book, In the Next Room. Later in the day the doctor came and was closeted with Papa for some time. He was a skilful man, of sixty and upwards. He wore powder and shaved his pale face as smooth as a pumpkin. He and Papa emerged from the room together, and I heard Papa laugh and say as they came out, Well, I do wonder if a wise man like you, what do you say to hippogriffs and dragons? The doctor was smiling and made answer, shaking his head. Nevertheless, life and death are mysterious states, and we know little of the resources of either. And so they walked on, and I heard no more. I did not then know what the doctor had been broaching. I think I can guess it now. This, folks, is just over the halfway mark, so if you want to um, refill your water or take a comfort break, we're going to step away for about five minutes, and then we will pick up with Chapter 5, a wonderful likeness in which nothing unsettling happens at all. I love those transitions. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, before we, we kick off with the second part, was it largely because I haven't quite finished my Suda? Um, I see the line about still waiting for Alice to do the shipping forecast, not going to lie. Hold that thought. <laughs> what are you doing on Wednesday? Um, a quick recap. We are four chapters into Carmilla by J. Sheridan Lafanu, which is the recollection by a young lady who grew up in a schloss, which is basically a castle in the Austrian countryside of the time and you will notice elements of absurdity as I recap this roll with them of the time a carriage crashed in front of the schloss the two ladies inside it were retrieved one of whom insisted that she couldn't afford to waste a second's hesitation and must leave immediately on a business trip and asked whether there was a hostel nearby or an inn in a nearby town where she could leave her daughter for the next three months <laughs> like you do like you do Please, take my daughter. Um, <laughs> Colonel Plot, the father of the main character, of course. Colonel Plot? <laughs> but, you know, but, but you don't understand. I have a house. Look at my house. She can stay with us. Uh, as, but, and in, in one of those kind of remarkably tone-deaf moments, <coughs> basically went, my daughter's really sad because the friend of hers that was going to stay with her is dead. Your daughter is roughly the same age and will do. She stays with us. What becomes really alarming is the moment the young woman is ensconced in the house and Carmilla goes up to see her. She remembers this is the exact woman she saw ten years previously in her bedroom alone at night who soothed her and held her and, and then she felt an agonizing pain in her chest for a moment and screamed and the entire household came in and there was no one there. What's even more alarming as Carmilla claims to have had a very similar dream about our lead and is caused tremendous physical discomfort by things like hymns and possibly daylight. So, what we have is... Um, Perfectly innocent nothing. Completely innocent nothing. It's a very gentle Victorian kind of a subtexty romance which absolutely is going to go sideways and get fangy pretty much any minute now. I'm finishing my shoe, the vamp. Literally. Ah. Oh, did you really? <laughs> Don't know the vampire. Definitely no vampires here. I've been waiting for the neck action. Let's go. Great. 
Well, it is a Victorian story. I'm surprised we haven't seen ankles yet. <laughs> Give me time. I'm gonna build up to ankles. Exactly. Oh, and also it's a Victorian story, so it's fat shaming and racist and incredibly sexist and I'm only laughing in horror at some of the stuff that Lothano just absolutely drops onto the page here. Thank you Zolia. Content warnings, Victorian sensibilities, fat shaming, assault of a child, threats, racism. This is a story very much of its time and its time it wasn't great. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Chapter 5. A Wonderful Likeness. This evening there arrived from Gratz the grave, dark-faced son of the picture cleaner, with a horse and cart laden with two packing cases, having many pictures in each. It was a journey of ten leagues, and whenever a messenger arrived at the Schloss from our little capital of Gratz, we used to crowd about him in the hall to hear the news. These, this arrival created in our secluded quarters quite a sensation. The cases remained in the hall, and the messenger was taken charge of by the servants till he had eaten his supper. Then, with assistance, and armed with hammer, ripping chisel, and turnscrew, he met us in the hall, where we had assembled to witness the unpacking of the cases. Carmilla sat looking listlessly on, while one after the other the old pictures, nearly all portraits, which had undergone the process of renovation, were brought to light. My mother was of an old Hungarian family, and most of these pictures, which were about to be restored to their places, had come to us through her. My father had a list in his hand, from which he read, as the artist rummaged out the corresponding numbers. I don't know that the pictures were very good, but they were undoubtedly very old, and some of them very curious, also. They had, for the most part, the merit of being now seen by me, I may say, for the first time, for the smoke and dust of time had all but obliterated them. There is a picture that I have not seen yet, said my father. In one corner, at the top of it, is the name, as well as I could read, Marcia Karnstein, and the date 1698, and I am curious to see how it has turned out. I remembered this one. It was a small picture, about a foot and a half high and nearly square without a frame, but it was so blackened by age that I could not make it out. The artist now produced it with evident pride. It was quite beautiful. It was startling. It seemed to live. It was the effigy of Carmilla. Carmilla, dear, here is an absolute miracle. Here you are, living, smiling, ready to speak in this picture. Isn't it beautiful, Papa? And see even the little mole on her throat. My father laughed and said, Certainly it is a wonderful likeness, but he looked away, and to my surprise seemed but little struck by it, and went on talking to the picture cleaner, who was also something of an artist, and discoursed with intelligence about the portraits of other works, which his art had just brought into light and colour, while I was more and more lost in wonder the more I looked at this picture. <laughs> Will you let me hang this picture in my room, Papa? I asked. Certainly, dear, said he, smiling. I'm very glad you think it's so like. It must be prettier even than I thought it, if it is. The young lady did not acknowledge this pretty speech. It did not seem to hear it. She was leaning back in her seat, her fine eyes under their long lashes, gazing on me in contemplation, and she smiled in a kind of rapture. And now you can read quite plainly the name that is written in the corner. It is not Marcia. It looks as if it was done in gold. The name is Makala, Countess Karnstein, and this is a little coronet over and underneath, A.D. 1698. I am descended from the Karnsteins. That is, Mama was. Ah, said the lady languidly. So am I, I think. A very long descent. Very ancient. Are there any Karnsteins living now? None who bear the name, I believe. The family were ruined, I believe, in some civil wars long ago. But the ruins of the castle are only about three miles away. How interesting, she said languidly. But see what beautiful moonlight. She glanced through the hall door, which stood a little open. Suppose you take a little ramble round the court and look down at the road and river. It is so like the night you came to us, I said. She sighed, smiling. She rose, and, each with her arm about the other's waist, we walked out upon the pavement. 
In silence, slowly, we walked down to the drawbridge, where the beautiful landscape opened before us. So you were thinking of the night I came here, she almost whispered. Are you glad I came? Delighted, dear Camilla, I answered. And you asked for the picture you think, like me, to hang in your room. She murmured with a sigh as she drew her arm closer about my waist and let her pretty head sink upon my shoulder. How romantic you are, Camilla, I said. Whenever you tell me your story, it will be made up chiefly of some one great romance. She kissed me, silently. I am sure, Carmilla, you have been in love, but that there, there is at this moment an affair of the heart going on. I have been in love with no one, and never shall, she whispered, unless it should be with you. How beautiful she looked in the moonlight. Shy and strange was the look with which she quickly hid her face in my neck and hair, with tumultuous sighs that seemed almost to sob, and pressed in mine a hand that trembled. Her soft cheek was glowing against mine. Darling, darling, she murmured, I live in you, and you would die for me. I love you so. I started from her. She was gazing on me with eyes from which all fire, all meaning had flown, and a face colourless and apathetic. Is there a chill in the air, dear? She said drowsily. I almost shiver. Have I been dreaming? Let us come in. Come. Come. Come in. You look ill, Carmilla. A little faint. You certainly must take some wine, I said. Yes, I, I will. I'm, I'm better now. I shall be quite well in a few minutes. Yes, do give me a little wine answered Carmilla as we approached the door. Let us look again for, for a moment. It is the last time, perhaps. I shall see the moonlight with you. How do you feel now, dear? Are you really better? I asked. I was beginning to take alarm, lest she should have been stricken with the strange epidemic that they said had invaded the country about us. Papa would be grieved beyond measure, I added, if he thought you were ever so little ill, without immediately letting us know. We have a very skilful do doctor near us, the physician who was with Papa today. I'm sure he is. I know how kind you all are, but dear child, I am quite well again. There is nothing ever wrong with me, but a little weakness. People say I am languid, I am incapable of exertion, I can scarcely walk as far as a child of three years, and every now and then the little strength I have falters, and I become as you have just seen me. But after all, I am very easily set up again, in a moment I am perfectly myself. See how I have recovered. So indeed she had, and I talked to her a great deal, and very animated she was, and the remainder of that evening passed without any recurrence of what I called her infatuations, I mean her crazy talk and looks, which embarrassed and even frightened me. But there occurred that night an event which gave my thoughts quite a new turn, and seemed to startle even Carmilla's languid nature into momentary energy. Six. A very strange agony. When we got into the drawing room, Anne had sat down to our coffee and chocolate, although Carmilla did not take any. She seemed quite herself again, and Madame and Mademoiselle de La Fontaine joined us and made a little card party, in the course of which Papa, Papa came in for what he called his dish of tea. When the game was over, he sat down beside Carmilla on the sofa and asked her a little anxiously whether she had heard from her mother since her arrival. She answered, no. He then asked whether she knew where a letter would reach her at present. I cannot tell, she answered ambiguously, but I have been thinking of leaving you. You have been already too hospitable and too kind. I have given you an infinity of trouble, and I should wish to take a carriage tomorrow and post in pursuit of her. I know where I shall ultimately find her, although I dare not yet tell you. <laughs> "'But you must not dream of any such thing,' exclaimed my father, to my great relief. 
We can't afford to lose you so, and I won't consent to your leaving us except under the care of your mother, who was so good as to consent to your remaining with us till she should herself return. I should be quite happy if I knew that you heard from her, but this evening the accounts of the progress of the mysterious disease that has invaded our neighbourhood grow ever more alarming, and, my beautiful guest, I do feel a responsibility, unaided by advice from your mother, very much. But I shall do my best, and one thing is certain, that you must, that you must not think of leaving us without her distinct di direction to that effect. We should suffer too much in parting from you to consent to it easily. Thank you, sir. A thousand times thank you for your hospitality, she answered, smiling bashfully. You have all been too kind to me. I have seldom been so happy in all my life before, as in your beautiful chateau, under your care, and in the society of your dear daughter. <clears throat> so he, gallantly in his old-fashioned way, kissed her hand, smiled and pleased at her little speech. I accompanied Carmilla as usual to her room and sat and chatted with her while she was preparing for bed. Do you think, I said at length, that you will ever fully confide in me? She turned round, smiling, but made no answer, only continuing to smile. You won't answer that, I said. You can't answer pleasantly. I ought not to have asked you. You were quite right to ask me that. Or anything. You do not know how dear you are to me, or you could not think any confidence too great to look for. But I am under vows. No nun half so awfully as I, and I dare not tell my story yet, even to you. The time is very near when you shall know everything. You will think me cruel, very selfish. But love is always selfish. The more ardent, the more selfish. How jealous I am, you cannot know. You must come with me, loving me to death, or else hate me and still come with me, and hating me through death and after. There is no such word as indifference in my apathetic nature. Now, Carmilla, you're going to talk your wild nonsense again, I said hastily. Not I, silly little fool as I am, and full of whims and fancies. For your sake, I'll talk like a sage. Were you ever at a ball? No. How you do run on. What is it like? How, how charming it must be. I almost forget it is years ago. I laughed. You're not so old. Your first ball can hardly be forgotten yet. I remember everything about it with an effort. I see it all as divers see what is going on above them, through a medium, dense, rippling, but transparent. There occurred that night what has confused the picture and made its colours faint. I was all but assassinated in my bed, wounded here. She touched her breast. I never was the same since. Were you dying? Yes, very. A cruel love, strange love that would have taken my life. Love will have its sacrifices. No sacrifice without blood. Let us go to sleep now. I feel so lazy. How can I get up just now and lock my door? She was lying with her tiny hands buried in her rich, wavy hair, under her cheek, her little head upon the pillow, and her glittering eyes followed me wherever I moved, with a kind of shy smile that I could not decipher. I bid her good night, and crept from the room with an uncomfortable sensation. I often wondered whether our pretty guest ever said her prayers. I certainly had never seen her upon her knees. In the morning she never came down until long after our family prayers were over, and at night she never left the drawing room to attend our brief evening prayers in the hall. If it had not been that it had casually come out in one of our careless talks that she had been baptised, I should have doubted her being a Christian. Religion was a subject on which I had never heard her speak a word. If I had known the world better, this particular neglect or antipathy would not have so much surprised me. The precautions of nervous people are infectious, and persons of a like temperament are pretty sure, after a time, to imitate them. I had adopted Carmilla's habit of locking her bedroom door, having taken into my head all her whimsical alarms about midnight invaders and prowling assassins. I had also adopted her precaution of making a brief search through her room to satisfy herself that no lurking assassin or robber was ensconced. These wise measures taken, I got into my bed and fell asleep. A light was burning in my room. This was an old habit, a very early date, in which nothing could have tempted me to dispense with. 
Thus fortified, I might take my rest in peace, but dreams come through stone walls. They light up dark rooms or dark and light ones, and their persons make their exits and their entrances as they please. And they laugh at locksmiths. I had a dream that night that was the beginning of a very strange agony. I cannot call it a nightmare, for I was quite conscious of being asleep, but I was equally conscious of being in my room and lying in bed, precisely as I actually was. I saw, or fancied I saw, the room and its furniture just as I had seen it last, except that it was very dark, and I saw something moving round the foot of the bed, which at first I could not accurately distinguish. But I soon saw that it was a sooty black animal that resembled a monstrous cat. It appeared to me about four or five feet long, for it measured fully the length of the hearth rug as it passed over it, and it continued toing and froing with the lithe, sinister recklessness of a beast in a cage. I could not cry out, although, as you may suppose, I was terrified. Its pace was growing faster, the room rapidly darker and darker, and at length so dark that I could no longer see anything of it but its eyes. I felt it spring lightly on the bed. The two broad eyes approached my face, and suddenly I felt a stinging pain, as if two large needles darted an inch or two apart, deep into my breast. I waked with a scream. The room was lighted by the candle that burnt there all through the night, and I saw a female figure standing at the foot of the bed, a little at the right side. It was in a dark, loose dress. Its hair was down and covered its shoulders. A block of stone could not have been more still. There was not the slightest stir of respiration. As I stared at it, the figure appeared to have changed its place and was now nearer the door. Then close to it, the door opened and it passed out. I was now relieved, unable to breathe and move. My first thought was that Carmilla had been playing me a trick and that I had forgotten to secure my door. I hastened to it and found it locked, as usual, on the inside. I was afraid to open it. I was horrified. I sprang into my bed and covered my head up in the bedclothes and lay there, more dead than alive, till morning. Chapter 7. Descending. It would be vain my attempting to tell you the horror with which, even now, I recall the occurrence of that night. It was no such transitory terror as a dream leaves behind it. It seemed to deepen by time and communicated itself to the room and the very furniture that had encompassed the apparition. I could not bear next day to be alone for even a moment. I should have told Papa, but for two opposite reasons. At one time I thought he would laugh at my story, and I could not bear as be its being treated as a jest, and at another I thought he might fancy that I had been attacked by the mysterious complaint which had invaded our neighbourhood. I had myself no misgivings of the kind, and as he had been rather an invalid for some time, I was afraid of alarming him. I was comfortable enough with my good-natured companions, Madame Peridon and the vivacious Mademoiselle Lafontaine. They both perceived that I was out of spirits and nervous, and at length I told them what lay so heavy on my heart. Mademoiselle laughed, but I fancied that Madame Peridon looked anxious. "'By the by,' said Mademoiselle, laughing, "'the long line three walk behind Camilla's bedroom window is haunted.' "'Nonsense.' exclaimed madame, who probably thought the theme rather inopportune. And who tells that story, my dear? Martin says he came up twice when the old yard gate was being repaired before sunrise, and twice saw the same female figure walking down the Lime Tree Avenue. So he well might, as long as there are cows to milk in the river fields, said madame, I dare say. But Martin chooses to be frightened, and never did I see fool more frightened. You must not... You must not say a word about it to Carmilla, because she can see down that walk from her room window, I interposed, and she is, if possible, a greater coward than I. Carmilla came down rather later than usual that day. I was so frightened last night, she said, so soon as we were together. 
and I am sure I should have seen something dreadful if it had not been for that charm I bought from the poor little hunchback whom I called such hard names. I had a dream of something black coming round my bed, and I awoke in a perfect horror, and I really thought for some seconds I saw a dark figure near the chimney place, but I felt under my pillow for my charm, and the moment my fingers touched it, the figure disappeared, and I felt quite certain only that I had it by me that something frightful would have made its appearance, and perhaps throttle me as it did those poor people we heard of. Well, listen to me. I began, and recounted my adventure, at the recital of which she appeared horrified. "'And had you the charm near you?' she asked earnestly. "'No, I had dropped it into a china vase in the drawing-room, but I shall certainly take it with me tonight, as you have so much faith in it.' "'At this distance of time, I cannot tell you, or even understand myself, how I overcame my horror so effectually as to lie alone in my room that night.' I remember distinctly that I pinned the charm to my pillow. I fell asleep almost immediately, and slept even more soundly than usual all night. Next night I passed as well. My sleep was delightful, deep, dreamless. But I wakened with a sense of lassitude and melancholy, which, however, did not exceed a degree that was almost luxurious. Well, I told you so, said Carmilla when I described my quiet sleep. I had such delightful sleep myself last night, I pinned the charm to the breast of my nightdress. It was too far away the night before. I am quite sure it was all fancy except the dreams. I used to think that evil spirits made dreams, but our doctors told me it is no such thing, only a fever passing by, or some other malady as they often do, he said, knocks at the door, and not being able to get in, passes on with that alarm. What do you think the charm is? said I. It has been fumigated or immersed in some drug and is an antidote against the malaria, she answered. Then it acts only on the body? Certainly. You don't suppose that evil spirits are frightened by bits of ribbon or the perfumes of a druggist's shop? No, these complaints wandering in the air begin by trying the nerves and so infect the brain. But before they can seize upon you, the antidote repels them. That, I am sure, is what the charm has done for us. It is nothing magical. It is simply natural. I should have been happier if I could have quite agreed with Carmilla, but I did my best, and the impression was a little losing its force. For some nights I slept profoundly, but still every morning I felt the same lassitude, and all anger weighed upon me all day. I felt myself a changed girl, a strange melancholy stealing over me, a melancholy I would not have interrupted. Dim thoughts of death began to open, and an idea that was slowly sinking took gentle and somehow not unwelcome possession of me. If it was sad, the tone of mind which this induced was also sweet. Whatever it might be, my soul acquiesced to it. I would not admit that I was ill. I would not consent to tell my papa or to have the doctor sent for. Carmilla became more devoted to me than ever, and her strange paroxysms of languid adoration became more frequent. She used to gloat on me with increasing ardour the more my strength and spirits waned. This always shocked me like a momentary glare of insanity. Without knowing it, I was now in a pretty advanced stage of the strangest illness under which mortal ever suffered. There was an unaccountable fascination in its earlier symptoms that more than reconciled me to the incapacitating effect of that stage of the malady. This fascination increased for a time until it reached a certain point when, gradually, a sense of the horrible mingled itself with it, deepening, as you shall hear, until it discoloured and perverted the whole state of my life. The first change I experienced was rather agreeable was very near the turning point from which began the descent of Avernus. Certain vague, strange sensations visited me in my sleep. The prevailing one was of that pleasant, peculiar cold thrill which we feel in bathing when we move against the current of a river. This was soon accompanied by dreams that seemed interminable, and were so vague that I could never recollect their scenery or persons, or any one connected portion of their action. 
but they left an awful impression. They left a sense of exhaustion, as if I had passed through a long period of great mental exertion and danger. After all these dreams, there remained on waking a remembrance of having been in a place very nearly dark, and of having spoken to people whom I could not see, and especially of one clear voice, of a female's, very deep, that spoke as if at a distance, slowly, and producing always the same sensation of indescribable solemnity and fear. Sometimes there came a sensation as if a hand was drawn slowly along my cheek and neck. Sometimes it was as if warm lips kissed me, and longer and longer and more lovingly as they reached my throat. But there the caress fixed itself. My heart beat faster. My breathing rose and fell rapidly and full-drawn. A sobbing that rose into a sense of strangulation supervened and turned into a dreadful convulsion in which my senses left me and I became unconscious. It was now three weeks since the commencement of this unaccountable state. My sufferings had, during the last week, told upon my appearance. I had grown pale, my eyes were dilated, darkened underneath, and the languor which I had long felt began to display itself in my countenance. My father often asked whether I was ill, but with an obstinacy which now seems to me unaccountable, I persisted in assuring him that I was quite well, in a sense, this was true. I had no pain. I could complain of no bodily derangement. My complaint seemed to be one of the imagination, or the nerves, and horrible as my sufferings were, I kept them with a morbid reserve very nearly to myself. It could not be that terrible complaint which the peasants called the Upaya, for I had now been suffering for three weeks, and they were seldom ill for much more than three days, when death put an end to their miseries. Carmilla complained of dreams and feverish sensations, but by no means of so alarming a kind as mine. I say that mine were extremely alarming. Had I been capable of comprehending my condition, I would have invoked aid and advice on my knees. The narcotic of an unsuspected influence was acting upon me, and my perceptions were benumbed. I am going to tell you now of a dream that led immediately to an odd discovery. One night, instead of the voice I was accustomed to hear in the dark, I heard one, sweet and tender, and at the same time terrible, which said, Your mother warns you to beware of the assassin. At the same time, a light unexpectedly sprang up, and I saw Carmilla standing near the foot of my bed, in her white nightdress, bathed from her chin to her feet, in one great stain of blood. I wakened with a shriek, possessed with the one idea that Carmilla was being murdered. I remember springing from my bed and in my next recollection, standing on the lobby, crying for help. Madame and Mademoiselle came scurrying out of their rooms in alarm. A lamp burned always on the lobby, and seeing me, they soon learned the cause of my terror. I insisted on our knocking at Carmilla's door, and our knocking was unanswered. It soon became a pounding and an uproar. We shrieked her name, but all was vain. We all grew frightened, for the door was locked. We hurried back in panic to my room. There we rang the bell long and furiously. If my father's room had been at that side of the house, we would have called him up at once to our aid, but alas, he was quite out of hearing, and to reach him involved an excursion for which none of us had courage. Servants, however, soon came running up the stairs. I had got on my dressing gown and slippers, meanwhile, and my companions were already similarly furnished. Recognising the voices of the servants on the lobby, we sallied out together, and having renewed as fruitlessly our summons at Carmilla's door, I ordered the men to force the lock. They did so, and we stood, holding our lights aloft in the doorway, and so we stared into the room. We called her by name, but there was still no reply. We looked around the room. Everything was undisturbed. It was exactly in the state in which I had left it, on bidding her good night. But Carmilla was gone. And that's where we'll leave it for the week. <laughs> so that's the first half of Carmilla by Jay Sheridan Lefanu. And uh, yeah, it is. it ends on a very, very teasy note. 
Um, but before we go, <laughs> let's do some shenanigans. Shenanigans is um, the weekly thing which we do on the Wednesday night stream over at EA, where we dive deep into the infinite pools of AO3 and Tumblr, Magnus Archives, fan fiction, and extra content, and pick out the things which have made us laugh the most. And this, this was a hands down winner this week. This is from um, a Tumblr called I Dig the Buried. And it is TM, it is the Magnus Archives Zoom Stereotypes. The pet introducer. Jonathan Sims is coming to you from Georgie's sofa, where he can't resist spending 75% of the meeting wrangling the Admiral as he walks in front of the camera and on the keyboard. Two, the outdoorsman. Tim Stoker signs on with blue sky and trees as his backdrop. He is definitely not spending his work week kayaking, and he definitely knows what the meeting is about. The multitasker. Sasha James is streaming Netflix or playing an MMORPG while on Zoom calls, but she has perfected the art of looking like she's paying attention and even chimes in on topic. The family cameo. Martin Blackwood is struggling to balance his work meeting with the constant interruptions of his mother in the background, not to mention the construction going on next door. 5. The Late Arrival Melanie King is never on time to any Zoom meeting. She rolls into the room 15 minutes after it has started and she doesn't even bother muting her mic while she orders Grubhub. 6. The Bad Connection Peter Lucas signs on with a screenshot reading Reconnecting and spends the entire meeting muted, pretending to have technical issues so he doesn't have to participate. 7. The Perfect Tableau Elias Bouchard has an impeccable setup. He is dressed in a three-piece suit, no pyjamas here, and well-groomed. His backdrop is a tasteful combination of art and a shelf of aesthetically pleasing books. There is one artificial plant. And there you go. <laughs> I think we're done for the night. And, like and, and we are coming in exactly on time. So, real quick, thank you all for joining us. This has been a huge amount of fun. Uh, please join us this time next week for the second half of Carmilla, in which I strongly suspect our lead character will buy a lot of clues very quickly. Um, just to wrap up, I have been Alistair Stewart. Those of you who follow Rusty Quill shows and will know me as Peter Lucas from the Magnus Archives, where I instructed Tim in Aikido and assisted Martin in his dance recital. The Rusty Quill is an entertainment company and podcast network focusing on audio drama. We create three weekly podcasts, The Magnus Archives, Argue Gaming, and Stella Firma, all of which are fantastic. Uh, you can support us via direct donation, subscribing on Twitch, uh, via Patreon, and do please tell your friends, because the beautiful thing about podcasts, especially in this year, is that everyone can enjoy them and everyone can share them. It has been a lovely end to the week. Also, there's a Discord server and a robotic voice. Uh, yeah, you, when people spend little bits, they can make it talk. That's amazing. I love that. Um, you can find us, both Marguerite and myself, next on Sunday at 10 a.m. when we will be playing a video game. That's a British standard time. Um, we can't tell you which video game it is yet. The last few weeks we've been playing Windbound, which is an excellent fantasy survival game. But Untitled Goose Game just got to play a co-op. So there may be Goose Primes! <laughs> There may, in fact, be goose crimes. If you join us on Sunday morning, there is a good chance that if you mess with the honks, you will get the bonks. Uh, then we will be back on Wednesday, and these are both at the EA Twitch uh, stream, where we will be doing Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking by Ursula Vernon, which is an incredibly funny fantasy novel. It's really, really good. Uh, and then we'll be back here next Friday for the conclusion of Carmilla. So, um, oh, and also, Next RQ streams, uh, Saturday at 4pm, Mike is going to be back with more Skyrim. 
so we will... And the threat. Oh. One last thing. In the style of Columbo. Uh, <laughs> also, um, thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, this has been an absolute blast. But uh, if you want to know a little bit more about Lafanu and his work and some interesting alternate versions of this stuff, uh, I will be posting a Twitter thread with show notes, including boy links to the books that I talked about and links to Sheridan Lafanu's work at Project Gutenberg. And this Tumblr thread. And this Tumblr thread and everything which we've discussed here over at my Twitter account, which is at Alistair Stewart. Uh, and that is at my name. I'll put it in the short. It'll, my, my Twitter account will drop in the chat in a minute. So, thank you so much once again, and uh, I'll see you here next week.